Hello, everyone. Good night. All right, good evening. My apologies. No worries. So did you guys start to talk about unit four? Or you all just sat here and said nothing to anybody? We were reading. <laughs> uh -huh. Good answer. <laughs> Okay, so when I ask questions and when I have a conversation tonight, that means you're participating in because you all in read. Reading in, 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 in the process of. <laughs> ah, okay, now that the truth is coming out in its entirety. <laughs> okay, so I see we still only have 22 people. I... A few people, a few people dropped a few messages like someone has a PTA meeting so a few people said that they would be logging on a bit later okay cool so that means we can go then we have we can have a we can we can start <laughs> so laundering the proceeds of tax evasion how, how y'all been before we start because I just getting into this how y'all been y'all y'all good y'all been y'all been following the things I've been dropping inside the, the group y'all been reading yeah, trying to, yes, ma'am. It's a lot. Yes, we've been. Okay. Y'all been keeping up with what I've been dropping. Y'all picking up what I'm putting on. Uh, for the most part. I only see a couple of people said they came on yesterday. Y'all missed a really good session. Free session, I might add. So, yeah. for those of you who have read, and for those of you who are still reading, can I get somebody to read the learning objectives for us so we could make sure we know what it is that we're doing um, today? And as you all know, this is the day for us to go over our um, assignment. So as soon as we're done going through this unit, we're going to have that conversation. Sure. So anybody? The purpose of this unit, oh. Oh, thanks, whoever asked, who's asked us today? <laughs> Sanders. <laughs> Who? Sanders. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's go, Sanders. Thank you. <laughs> the purpose of this unit, sorry, unit four, laundering the proceeds and tax evasion. The purpose of this unit is to one, explain what is meant by tax evasion and tax avoidance, two, provide an overview of international approaches to tax liabilities and the role of the money laundering reporting officer in relation to criminal and civil liability linked to taxation, and three, consider the role of customer due diligence in preventing a financial services businessman business from becoming implicated in the laundering of money that has been illegally withheld from the tax authorities. The nature of tax evasion. The discussion between tax avoidance lawful and tax evasion unlawful is a gray area that has been exploited for decades. An offshore financial services firm that provides services in order to enable its clients to evade on onshore taxes may be guilty of money laundering. In the not too distant past, the risk of prosecution was ne ne negligible, as on the onshore revenue authorities had little chance of obtaining hard evidence of tax evasion against the taxpayer or complicity against the financial services firm. Tax audits and criminal investigations hit a stone wall in the form of offshore banking secrecy. Clients got away with not paying tax on their significant investment income and gains while service providers made a fortune in fees as their client base and wealth under management increased year on year. Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. This comfortable state don't, of don't, affairs- Don't read that one, don't, don't okay. read that one. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about that one. Go to the next as a result of. Right, right as below a, it. As a result of these new disclosure requirements, an individual of high net worth who resides on shore for tax purposes 
but whose wealth is managed by a foreign financial institution located offshore may be more easily exposed. If this is the case, the professional services firm is in turn exposed to the risk of criminal liability for money laundering. This affects not only the customer due diligence and reporting duties imposed upon the FFI, but has serious consequences for its entire business model. In order to appreciate the risk that a firm will be held for money, liable for money laundering, the proceeds of tax evasion, its money laundering reporting officer or compliance officer should be aware of the firstly tax and secondly morning disclosure rules. If there is a suspicious, if there's a suspicion that funds are or represent the proceeds of crime, it will trigger an anti-money laundering reporting requirement. Continue on. In this Hi, minute, I'm having a whole conversation with you on mute. No, sorry. I, 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 I'm talking to myself, then I realize, oh, hey, I'm mute. Um, no, thanks so much. Uh -huh. So uh, most of, well, every week so far, we've had conversations about uh, taxes and, you know, where we're moving to um, in the Bahamas. So I told you not to read the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act because I wanted someone to say, like, what is it known as? I think we talked about it last week very briefly. What is that known as? The common name. Sorry, FATCA. Yes. Thanks, David. FATCA. You know, we like acronyms, right? And FATCA is what, David? The Quizia, the Merit. Could you please mute for us? Thank you. Appreciate it. David, you can tell us what FATK is. You have you have any idea? Don't read it from the book now, David, because you you no. So FATK is just um, basically it's a U.S. based um, uh, requirement for institutions to disclose U.S. citizens. So it's typically, I mean, I can put it in a um, typically financial institutions requires. Um, their clients to fill out this form just to disclose whether or not they're um, U.S. citizens for tax purposes. Or U.S. persons, not just citizens, because, you know, you have different yeah, classes. Yeah, U.S. persons, yeah. Right, right, correct. And so when FATCA came around, everyone was saying, oh, my God, how is the U.S. going to kind of force other countries, right, to pretty much... I wouldn't say collect their tax, but report, right, on their persons um, from a tax basis when a lot of countries at that time didn't even have, you know, evasion um, avoidance, I would say, as, as a criminal act, right? But we all st stood in awe as the U.S. managed to have lots of countries sign uh, agreements with them to ensure that the countries themselves are reporting. If you don't report directly to the IRS, um, you know, they have different models, one and two, IGAs is what, what, what it's called, what they're commonly known by. Um, and the Bahamas, we don't, we don't uh, our financial institutions does not report directly to the IRS. We report to the government of the Bahamas, who in turn reports to the IRS. That's the model that we sign, which is probably the better model for our country. Um, and also, well, the current AG was the person who at that time was the Minister of Financial Services. So he was, as a tax lawyer, he was, I would consider to be, I guess, one of the best persons uh, to be able to, to navigate us through that whole process. So for us, we are now moving into the tax space in this country. However, all of the first world countries have been in that space for a very long time. So when we talk about taxes in the Bahamas, we might, we have to pay customs, right? We don't have direct income tax as yet. We have lots of other taxes, but for the most part, people don't see us as a 
high tax jurisdiction because they're thinking income tax. But by the time you didn't pay all of your fees, your real, your real property tax, your customs tax, you know, your fees uh, for driving on the road, licensing fees, this fees, the next fees, we are taxed, right? But the outer world doesn't see that. They only see the fact that, hey, we're not getting direct income tax. So when we go through this top chapter, we have to think, okay, some of this doesn't really uh, relate to the Bahamas. However, when you're writing your papers, you have to think, okay, international, you have to think, you know, global, where we're an international financial jurisdiction and center. And so we have to ensure that when we keep up with best practice and minimum standards globally, then in order for us to play, like we said last week, we have to ensure that um, our financial institutions are doing what's best, not only for them as an institution, but what's best for us as a country. And because we've already signed all of these agreements with well, for FAC, it's the US, and for CS, CRS, it's the other uh, countries in the world. We have to play by the rules, right? So, Sans. when we go, hi. Yeah, I just had a quick question in terms of FATCA and um, I guess disclosure of that information. How often is it that I guess the government is approached to disclose information? relating to, I guess, U.S. citizens for FATCA purposes? How often does that normally happen? Because I know, obviously, anytime, for instance, from a bank perspective, or but, but any financial institution, you have to fill out the form um, if you're a U.S., quote-unquote, U.S. citizen or U.S. Um, fall under that, that branch of individuals who fall under that, that heading. But how often is that... Um, does that ever happen in terms of that disclosure of that information itself? Are you aware Reporting of is done annually. Okay. It's, there's a portal and financial institutions have to make sure that their portals are uploaded, even if you have a nil report, right? right? So there's a period and the um, competent authority in the office of the government of the Bahamas out of the Ministry of Finance, um, they would tell you when the portal is going to be open for FATCA reporting. And so financial institutions know what time of the year reporting starts and stops. So it's, it's an annual process because you're reporting to the government of Bahamas who then in turn reports in aggregate amounts to the IRS. So it's, a, it's an annual process. Same thing for CRS. Right, okay. Okay. Do, do we have anybody in here who is familiar with the FATCA reporting? Anybody that works in the bank who would have, even if you're not the person doing it, because you have to have a FATCA, you have to have a named person responsible for FATCA in the organizations, um, David. You don't know who your named person is? Do, do I know who the person is in my... In your, in your organization, yeah, because there's yes, a name. Yes, yes, I, I, I know who the individual is. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. I've, I've, never, I've never done it, so... I mean, I've only just moved to. If, you, if you've only just joined, yeah. Look, look, look towards August and September for the reporting to start happening. So you haven't, right. you haven't gotten to that cycle yet, but yeah, it's coming. Yeah, so I'll definitely be part of the process, but I've, I've never done it before, so um, it'll be, I guess, the first time I'm doing it and experiencing it first time. Okay, so let me give you just a piece of advice: bring your patience, okay? <laughs> I'm telling well, you, the yes. process, the process is not a very difficult process. However, sometimes when you go in the portal and you can't, the portal goes, let me try and explain it. It's, it's like, um, if you have one thing off in your reporting sequence, it, it won't allow you to upload. And that can be very frustrating. That's what I'm trying to say. Because I know there, there have been a time for one of my clients, I was trying to do a reporting and mind you, it was a nil report because we didn't have any US persons, right? right? But there was just one thing out of sequence and oh my God, David, I felt like I was going to pull it all in my hair. <laughs> so even right. though it's not a very difficult process, um, the reporting itself could be tedious if 
if you, it, you know, it's almost like an accountant. If you can't find 25 cents to balance, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's how it is. Um, I'm so happy that I don't have to do that anymore. Um, to be honest with you, that's, that's one task that I was quite happy to offload. <laughs> I'll brace myself then. <laughs> yes, please, please do so. Yes. Yeah. Sons, I have a Hi. question in relation to um what David was saying. Would a would would the MLRO be the person within the institution really dealing with that? Um, most times, but then you could you could also uh, name your chief financial officer or somebody okay. in that department. Okay. Because remember now you're talking taxes. Mm-hmm. 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 So it's up to the institution, but it has to be a senior person because that person um, name and everything information has to, to go to the IRS. So you, you don't want to send no junior person to be responsible for that. Okay. 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 Yeah. But in most institutions, it's the MLRO. Um, okay. And even if they're the named person, they would get some help probably from, you know, the, I would say finance department. Because a lot of compliance persons are not specifically accountants, right? Right, that is true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank so, you for answering that question. Okay. No worries. Um, so you'd see some definitions in here about tax and income tax and all of those things. A lot of them don't pertain specifically to the Bahamas. You have to be familiar with the taxes that we pay in this country. Um, however, if you are working for a global company, then obviously these are things that you need to know. Yes? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Sands, where do you see the Bahamas going in terms of um, taxes? I mean, obviously, uh, there's been conversations about corporate tax and obviously income tax, um, but uh, where do you see the Bahamas going in terms of that, in terms of income tax or corporate tax? What do you think would be the first to be essentially imposed? I don't want it to be income. Um, to be honest with you, <laughs> based on where we are globally, I think we're going to be, and this is my personal opinion, based on my experience mm -hmm. and my knowledge um, in the industry, I think we're going to be forced to do a corporate tax soon, to be honest with you. Um, so I think we're gonna have to get that up and running first, because if, you, if, if you're watching the space, you, you are seeing that all of the G8, G20 countries are pretty much trying to force you into a position of adopting a minimum corporate tax. And then from there, I think we're going to be seeing everybody um, move towards income tax. If I were the government of the Bahamas, and this is my personal opinion, so you all could throw rocks at me, but you know we're <laughs> virtual, so I won't feel them. Um, I would implement. I would implement both, mm -hmm. but I would do it in a way that once I implement the income tax, I would cut out some of this national insurance, all of these other little things that you pay. You understand what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. the government has to have a revenue base. We want them to fix the road where they're getting the money from. Customs cannot and will no, not. Real property, that. real property tax. That's where the money comes from. Yeah, a lot of money. <laughs> a lot of money. Yeah. Don't pay real property tax. Yeah, but exactly. That's well, where the that's where the money can come from. Real property tax and the enforcement mm -hmm. of that. Right. Well, my, my son. What happens to the other people? Um, how do I put this politely? That don't pay real property tax because they're in a different bracket. Yeah. But then, Miss um, Sons, that would speak to like an increase in minimum wage. Oh. Um, to be honest, I think it should be on a sliding scale. I okay. think it should be a tax based on where you are. Okay. okay. This is my personal opinion, y'all. Mm -hmm. Because for okay. me. If you come in to me for, if you come to me for four different small things, for me, hit me one time and let me be done with it. But isn't, isn't real property tax taxed on a scale, on a sliding that, scale? That, uh, that is taxed on a sliding scale. 250 or more. 
at the end of the day, I mean, in, in all countries, the wealthy pay the least amount of money in taxes. Yes, that is true. So I think everybody has to look at, okay, if there's a minimum and there's a maximum, there's a range, I think that's the, as fair as you can get. And I think somebody put something in the group that's talking about, yeah, see, they're going to force you into a, a, a global minimum tax. I, they've been talking about it from last year. And if we don't stay in our position soon, it's going to be mandated to us. I guess the question is, what impact does corporate tax have on, I guess, the salaries of individuals? Mm -hmm. Because someone said, um, I think it's Denisha that said she prefer corporate tax over income tax. But I mean, would it really make a difference? I mean, because if the companies are being taxed, they're going to have to find um, revenue for, um, from somewhere. And that somewhere will likely be employee salaries. <laughs> David, if you look at it, if you look at it from this perspective, most of the companies that are sitting here that have a head office, they send that money up anyway. Yes. Correct. Yes. That money goes up to the head office. So right. the way that I see it, all they have to do is send the head office less. Right. The mm -hmm. work is being done here. The employees are here. The profits are being generated here. So why are you not paying taxes here? If they was to do that, if they was to do that, they would still say they are they they are they would say they're not operating, making a profit, even though they know they are. But if they have to pay that, they, companies will say they're not making a profit, and that will lead to well, probably even lead to staff cuts. No, you can't say you're making a profit because I can tell you, I run a licensed entity, and every year we have to submit audited financials to our regulator. You can't tell me you're making a profit. That ain't gonna work. Because yeah. it always it always amazed me that banks banks would be like okay, they would get down on us saying that oh this physical we haven't made this. Mm -hmm. It's because last physical y'all probably made X amount of dollars y'all make like X less now y'all saying it's not a profit so now they saying okay we looking at staff cuts. But they're yeah. always profitable. I think the margins are different, and I think that's what that's what we miss as employees. But as an employer, I can tell you that most companies make profit. If they don't make a profit, why are you think they're in business? They, they are just uh, comparing. So like, let's just say last year they made 5% profit and this year they made 3% profit to them or we make a profit. Yeah, yeah, you make a profit, you just made less than you made last year. And staff cuts is always the first thing, but a lot of companies recognize though when you cut your staff, you even cut your profit line more. You're not actually growing your profit because for most financial institutions, your greatest asset is your employees. I don't care how much technology you bring into the, 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 the workplace and, and how much you digitize, you need human beings to actually manage a lot of the analytics. So a computer could spit out plenty of things, but who's looking at it to see what right and what wrong? You see what I'm saying? So it's all about the spin that they put on it. And then we as employees, we need to start being more cognizant of what, what we're being told and what's being pushed down our throats. How many of you look at the actual audited financial statements of the companies you work for? Yep. Plenty. How many plenty of you do that? Going, um, um, going out and dividends to the shareholders. Yeah. That's what they do. They pay it up. They roll it up. So for me, I the best position for me to be in as an employee is to be an informed employee. So when my manager come to me and talk garbage about, oh, we make no money, uh, hold on, let me pull out this order in the financial statement. That is usually in a newspaper if it's a publicly traded company or the SCB, you know a regulator have to have the information. No, 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 let me, let me pull this out. And a lot of companies have that information on their website for their uh, investors, yeah? You go and you get that and you say, okay, fine. If your hands are tied, tell me your hands tied, but don't tell me you're make no money. Because I can see the dividend that you declared. Yes? <laughs> and as this is a compliance course, I can tell you all, compliance budget is probably the first thing to get slashed. But guess what? When the regulator come in, you can't tell them, oh, we slashed the compliance budget so they don't know X, Y, and Z. Because a lot of companies are now recognizing the cost of non-compliance dwarfs the cost of compliance. 
you might as well train the people because if you get a breach or something goes wrong mm -hmm. or you experience some reputational risk, the cost of that is significantly higher than the cost of ensuring that everything is done properly. We, we, you all understanding me? Agreed. Yes, ma'am. Um, Farida, I had a question. The with the whole um, corporate tax um, implementation or whatever it is, or whatever we can expect to see in the future, is it based? Is it a tax on local businesses or just foreign companies that? They, they, can have a double, they, they can have a double regime, but, but what, I, what, I'm, what I'm seeing is, to be honest with you, our government is very, and I'm talking both sides, they're very um, protective of local businesses because a lot of the, the, if you look at a lot of the things that are in place, even when we have to do reporting, it's minimum reporting for, for local companies. Because we don't have a local tax regime at the moment, like corporate regime or income tax regime, I think they, they try and be as cognizant um, to the fact that whatever they do locally is going to affect the population that has to vote them into power. So they manage that pretty well, in my opinion. However, you could pass a law that says, you know, all of the global companies have to do X, Y, and Z. So, I mean, it's going to affect your comp your, your uh, citizenry, but generally it's only going to affect that percentage that works in, you know, let's just say financial services, as opposed to if you implement it and force it into the local economy, it affects more people. And those more people is the same set of people you're going back to, to ask to vote for you. You understand? So politically, okay. it's a very delicate balancing act. Okay. I mean, even with even with if if the decision was made to only tax or for it to be only to be applicable for foreign companies, I still think it would be a balancing act because then you probably would see some companies leave the jurisdiction, right? Well, the thing about it is, anywhere they go, they have to get taxed. So it, 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 think about it. If if G twenty countries are saying that all countries should have a minimum corporate tax, where they going? Yeah, that's true. A lot of these companies nice. realize that they, they're very profitable in the Bahamas, you know. Oh, yeah. As opposed to other, other, other countries that has the same company, the Bahamas really is bringing a lot, especially for these banks. The Bahamas bring in the most profit all the time in the Caribbean. So, Ms. Sands, um, your opinion is in terms of like corporate tax, you're, you're um, just, just for clarification, you're saying that because these anti like different financial and well, just companies or IBC is like how they're operating here, that um, we should implement a co um, corporate taxes for them? The thing about it is you want, the, the, we want to be forced to. We don't have much choice. We don't have much choice. We are living in a global connected society. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I think that everybody should be made to pay their fair share, right? I agree. I agree with that. So, I mean, and I think for us, it's, it, that's a difficult pill to swallow for most Bahamians mm -hmm. because we're not accustomed to people touching our money. But yeah. for me, I'm a very realistic person. I cannot hold the government accountable for certain things when I don't want to pay my customs when I don't want to pay my road traffic fee, when I don't want to pay certain things. So at the end of the day, for me, charge me what you have to charge me and don't come back. Let's just deal with this one shot. That's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. And so I think, but you need to have the wherewithal to do that because behemoths are, you know, very fickle people. So at the end of the day, don't touch their money because then you have a problem. But how do you expect certain things to happen in your country when you do not want to contribute to the economic position that your country is in. We have a lot of money in the Bahamas, let's, let's be real. But on the other hand, we still have a lot of poverty because there's a disparity, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So I think if we all look at it from our professional lenses and say, hey, if you go in a store, you can buy a sweet water tennis, yes, for $2. But you, that sweet water tennis, you could be replacing every two, three months because it, it can't stand the pressure. But you go and you buy a pair of Nike tennis for $50, you could have that for a year, two years. So what is it going to be? You pay for the Nike or you keep buying the sweet water because you only spend on that $2. But you spend on that so frequently, it got add up to more than the Nike over the course of time. And I think that's a conversation that needs to be had. I also think that Bahamians need to be educated on taxes. I think we need to have more um, educational, I, I would say seminars, webinars, whatever it is, to educate Bahamians on financial matters, period. Everybody telling us about, you know, we don't save and Bahamians don't have no savings and mm -hmm. we don't save because we're a consumer country. Yes. However, yeah. when we talk about taxes, everybody is against it. But if you talk to them about the whole financial services gamut and how it relates to them and them personally, I am sure that the more educated your population is, the more they can see why certain things are necessary. The problem comes in when people pay in taxes and they don't see the government doing anything. But then we want the government, right? I agree. Yeah. I think it's just a trust issue. The people having with the government spending, you know, dealing with their money and handling money. I agree. I think it's a trust issue. Mm -hmm. um, Corruption. I, I, yeah, but I, I, I say the same thing, but I mean, I don't know how many of y'all are religious and we don't, we're not going to be talking about no religious things. But if I make an example that's very popular in the Bahamas, how much, how much of your officers pay tithes and return offerings and all these different things? We don't question what the pastors do with it. Because we think ain't God to bless us. Okay. And God has already told you, I, I get it, but God has already told you, run under Caesar with his hands, yes? Correct. Yes, pay your taxes. Correct. Yeah, that's that correct. Is correct. If, that's Jesus, correct. if Jesus sent them to get the money out of the fish mouth to pay taxes, why then are we not seeing that from that same perspective? That's all I can say in religion. Fair point. I, I, I do agree. I think it's a trust issue. Even though we have, you know, income tax or the corporate tax, I think people look at, you know, what has been done with monies raised from the government from VAT and other things, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, I'm sure it's still a substantial amount of revenue that's being collected from like customs duties and VAT and real property tax and it just I, I think people just want to know what is being done with that money and, and the government, both, whatever government, I don't think they've, they've done well with being accountable or having a good track record of how that money is spent. I, whilst I agree with you, I still feel like even if there was some accountability, you could have the people saying, well, why are we spend it like this? I'm just saying. <laughs> you understand? I think which way people there, have an there issue. There will always be a complaint. Agreed. Always be an yeah, issue. Yeah. To lose them, yeah. So I just think it, it's something that we as a country have to mature to. And I think the day is coming when we won't have a choice. And so for us who are in this class, um, I think it behoves all of you to ensure that the people around you understand why certain things need to be done. I think once you have an understanding you're better able to swallow, tolerate whatever word you want to use, um, why things are the way that they are. You're taking this class, the Bahamas won't be the first country that, to, to, to pay taxes. Other places you go, I love London. Love, love, love London. I spend my 17% VAT and don't say a word. Wow. Not a peep, but it's 17 to 20% in London. And I pay it happily. Y'all understand what we're saying? Y'all mm -hmm. go to the U.S., y'all pay federal tax, and y'all pay county tax. Happily. We, we don't have a choice. <laughs> That's that, right. that, that is my point, Miss Sanders. That's my point right there. I but to add to that, <laughs> to, to add to that, you pay that happily because you enjoy the benefits from that tax. You enjoy the nice um, highways. 
you enjoy the low prices in, in the stores. So I'm just saying, I hope that when it's implemented here, then the benefits also flow. I don't enjoy no benefit, Nicola, when I just shop it. I, the benefit is me getting some of my want, but I pay another seven eight percent. But I'm saying you you enjoy it because they have such a robust tax system. Because the the taxes that are collected, they use to to improve or pour into the country. That's what I'm saying. That's why we happily pay the taxes in our other jurisdictions. So I'm saying when it comes on stream here, I hope that we are afforded the same amenities. The, but the people who live there complain just like how we complain here. Yeah, they do. <laughs> the people over there complain just the way that we complain here all the time. Every time I go, is somebody protesting. I don't know how you can be a U.S. citizen and be broke. I'm sorry. I, I just don't understand it. The same way you can live in the Bahamas and go hungry. I think it's reality. very possible to be broken. I, mean, I, 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 I <laughs> homelessness is on the rise now. Uh, I don't know. I think they probably one of them choose homelessness because of depression and stuff. I agree. So, I hear you, Patrick. Um, but it's. It is for anything is possible. However, it's very hard to be homeless and not to afford anything in the city. Like you have a book, you could go and purchase one coupon book. I've seen it firsthand. One coupon book and survive. That's off coupon. That's off coupon. Uh, so I, I find it very hard to do to be homeless and suffering in the states as opposed to here. Here, the cost of living be like what 10th, ninth or tenth in the world for the most expensive place to live. You mean number six? Oh we're in number six now, yeah. <laughs> so I could see you not know, having nothing to eat over here. But in the States I really can't see that. Because in the States they have a men's social inequality, I have to disagree with that. But um, like anywhere else, but I feel like with the social inequalities and the racial thing, social inequality, which also deals with um, access to certain things, I can't readily agree with that. But you have a, you have a what, what, what social inequality? Um, well, my degree is in sociology, and we did a study. And the study was really um, based on, we did it in Canada, but it was based on how, how the demographics in terms of like racial discrimination leads to like homelessness and poverty within Canada and also the US. And um, it's very, I mean, it's like a real life scenario where you can actually be broke in the US, coupons or not, and homeless. Okay, so. Let's, let's, let's bring taxes back into this, into this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if, if you have whatever disparities you're talking about, <laughs> yes. they also have a very good social welfare system, yes? Mm -hmm. Where do you think that money coming from? Taxes. It has to be generated from somewhere. The government can only generate money in a couple of ways, yes? Yes. So... However you look at it, we should be right back to the, to, to, to the topic. You, I think we as human beings have to learn. We're not always on the same button, right? Right. right. We have to carry some people. Now, I, I agree some people just lazy and they don't work. Okay, we're talking about them sad. But there are people who cannot work. And so when you pay your, your fair share, Mm -hmm. I'm not saying overtax any particular uh, group of people. When you pay a fair share of taxes, you make the country better for everybody to live in. So let's move on to some of the examples that they talk about in the book. They talk about um, effective management. They talk about double taxation treaties. Now, I can't lie to you all. I don't know what treaties we have in the Bahamas as it relates to double taxation, maybe an attorney can help us with that. But I do know that we do have treaties that we've signed. Now from a tax perspective, I really can't say 
if we have any double tax treaties signed um, as a country. Does anybody know? Any of my attorney uh, students know? I'm, I'm unaware. I, I don't know of any. Um, so. Don't miss out calling your name, Dave. Joey here? Rodrigo here? Rochelle here? I'm here, but I, I don't know of any double tax treaties okay. that, that we may have here. Michelle, Rodrigo? I, I don't know of any either. Sorry. Okay. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know either. That's why I'm, I'm asking the attorneys. Any yeah, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that we have any, though. Google said no. I'm not aware of any either. You all hear what Alicia said? She said Google say no, so I guess the answer is no way. Thanks, Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't think that we have any, not that I'm aware of. And okay. I did look that up before. Okay, thanks. I think I'll 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 ask the AG that question the next time I see him. Um, so the book talks about double taxation at the OECD, said that treaties. They talk about typical onshore anti-tax avoidance provisions. Now, can somebody tell me the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion? For, for those who are reading or have read, y'all should not answer to that. Tax avoidance. Tax. Patrick, you're very tax low. <laughs> oh, tax. <laughs> tax avoidance is legal and tax evasion is illegal. Can you hear me? Uh, Patrick, I know you was in my intermediate class. We had a whole conversation about this. You need more tax than that from you. Tax, tax avoidance is where you try to avoid a tax, where you, and I guess an example would be where you transfer your money perhaps to another jurisdiction where you would incur less taxes on your money as opposed to whatever jurisdiction it may be in previously, you pay a higher tax there. So if you transfer it over, you may pay a lower tax, and that is tax avoidance. Tax evasion would be where you completely and willfully choose to um, not pay taxes. And I guess a local example would be us, you know, coming through um, the airport and you put on your customs declaration. Have you shopped and have you done this and blah, blah, blah. And you say no. So you choose to evade the payment of taxes on the items which you would have bought into the country. That is an excellent example, Joey. And I was hoping Patrick would have said that because in our intermediate class, we had a whole conversation about coming through customs with your five bags and only spent $300. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for that con uh, definition because, you know, I mean, if the truth be told, all us, all, every one of us, I don't do it anymore, but I have done it in the past. And most behemoths, I know very few behemoths that I've list never, all I've of them. Never done it. I've never done it. I've never done it neither. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you never done what? Never, never done, done, never done what, David? I, 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 I've never, never what, David? I've never... <laughs> I've David, never avoided all taxes. Get like <laughs> so y'all really declare y'all declare each and every item on your receipt? No. I didn't really no. Absolutely but. no. David, you know David, you know David, David, to be honest. Because be honest. if you don't $1, declare $1, if you don't declare each and, each and every item of your receipt, um, on your receipt, then you're evading. Yeah, so but to be honest, I don't do a lot David. of shopping. That is very I don't do a lot of you. shopping. I do a lot of um, online shopping. So when I do travel, wow. I don't I don't have anything to really declare like that. So um, that is very admirable. Very, very, uh, so I'm being very truthful. Um, but who knows? That may change. What? No, I'm joking. <laughs> They're being recorded, right? So I'm joking. Notice, notice only the men are saying that they never did it. I don't see why, though. No, that's that's like that's five hundred dollars, you know. Like, why would you not use your five hundred dollars? That's only if you shop. If you go and shop. Yeah. 
Joey, that's only like two pairs of shoes, though. Well, for me, that's good vibe. But if that's, you know, I, I, I hope to get to you. <laughs> yes, yeah, for me, that's only like two pairs of shoes, though. But David, David wow. ain't doing it because someone's doing it for him. <laughs> David, <laughs> when you, you, have the line, you pay taxes, you pay taxes. But when you, when you bring them in on your person through the airport, then that's where you get the coupon, right? You can't use the coupon online. Right. So that's what I'm saying. David ain't doing the shopping because somebody doing the shopping for him. Someone's yeah. trying to do. That's well, nice. David. Or <laughs> right. So that was a that was an excellent example of the difference between avoiding and evading. I mean, and that's you know, lawyers and accountants, that's what that's what that's what they do. They help their clients to reduce is what they call it, their tax burden. Yes. 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 Correct. Right. Um, and I can tell you, I, I watch a lot of podcasts and, and TED Talks, and the wealthy pays very little money in taxes because they have accountants and attorneys to tell them how to get around all of the, you know, who understand the tax code of the federal governments in, in the countries in which they live. Especially in the states. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So now, because we have the FATCA regime and we have CRS, um, we have mandatory disclosure requirements, right? So it's very difficult these days for most people around the world. I mean, obviously, there's, you're always going to have that few um, to say, hey, well, uh, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't have this, I don't have that, because because the, the countries have an acted law, I mean, you're reporting it like a report it for you. Because I wanna keep my banking license. So whether or not you have told your government that you have this amount of money in, in, in my bank, I tell in my government, you have it. Now you can figure out how everything else is gonna pan out when you do your tax reporting. But from our perspective, we are mandated to make sure that it's done. Those disclosures are not, uh, what's, what's, what's the word when it's not mandatory? Uh, voluntary, they're mandatory. So when you talk about the US tax regime, anybody in here who works in, in, in an international uh, bank and you have any type involvement with FATCA, you'd know the forms. I am a Bahamian, but I know W9, WA, WA Ben, WA Benny, all the forms that are necessary for reporting you would be familiar with. Anybody else in here works along with or working in an apartment? But I mean, if you work in compliance, you would have to see those forms if you have US persons as your clients. Anyone who, who is familiar with the W8, W8 Benny, W8 Ben, W9? Yeah, I've, I've seen them um, during the course of uh, my employment. Um, of course, the FATCA forms I see all the time, and that's you know, for managed entities, the managed entities that we have, that's one of the requirements to have um, that FATCA form completed. Um, but I, again, W8, W9, those forms I have seen as well as part of the KYC um, documentation required for our clients. Everyone in here should have seen a FATCA form because it's mandatory for even even my local bank account. I have to fill Yeah, the local banks. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have to fill them out as well. Yoli, 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 In fact, Yoli, I just Yoli, saw Yoli, one this Yoli. week. Sorry? Okay. I, you agree with me, Joey, so I, I get it. But I'm saying everybody else is so quiet, like they've never filled out a FATCA form. Well, actually, Nobody. that's one of the requirements at, at Commonwealth Bank, too. So we usually, um, the one of the requirements is to complete the FATCA form if you're opening up accounts. We've actually, well, they've actually started that on the credit side as well. But as it relates to reporting, you know, we, I haven't, you know, had an opportunity to see what it's like because, you know, in branch, we don't do reporting and that's done in a separate union. Right. But you yourself would have had to fill out a FATCA form is what I'm saying, right? We all Correct. have had to fill Correct. them out. Yes. 
yeah. because it's, it's mandatory. So when, when we talk oh, about CRS. Um, pardon? FATCA or CRS? For, uh, for, FATCA. for us, it's FATCA. FATCA, yes. Hmm. Um, Ms. Sands, you're saying as a client of the bank, all of us should have filled out a FATCA form? If you don't fill out one, I need to find out who where you use bank and talk to your com their compliance officer. Because Commonwealth Bank made me fill out one. Hmm. Which makes me to know that every bank is doing it or should be doing it because it's a mandatory form. You have to declare that you're not a US person. Plenty behemoths born in America. You all know what time it is? Yeah, it is. Your, your account, you probably ain't been in the bank for a minute to update your account, but I can tell you, whenever your account gets reviewed or you go in for a loan or you go in for a new product, they will make you fill it out. I didn't fill out one when I initially opened the account either, but I got it. I had to, I had to do something last year. And trust me, the FATCA form was right there. I had to declare that I'm not a US person. Okay. Hmm. Not just that, you have to declare that you don't pay taxes over there as well. They probably don't even know because they always scotch that section out. Probably ignore it, but you put on that. I can I can guarantee you somebody in the bank getting written up if the FATCA forms in on on file. How recent was that for you? I tell you, I just do it. Must be December or January. <laughs> Literally. Uh, wow. But that's been implemented uh, for a while back now. So. Right. So that's what I'm saying because I I. I've been a Commonwealth Bank, uh, what do you call it, customer for a long time. So I had my account before that. You see what I'm saying? But right. something, I can't remember what I did, but something I did on my account, and you know, they say, okay, we have to update or whatever it is. So whenever you, when, whenever, it, whenever the update took place, I had to fill out that form. I, I don't, I mean, I haven't seen it, I and mean, I've opened up accounts at different banks, um, and they haven't required me to fill out the forms, and it could very well just be because um, they see the passport, they see that I'm Bahamian, and place of birth says Bahamas, so it's just not a requirement. So I, I've, and I've heard in circumstances where, of course, if, if you're um, Bahamian American, as you mentioned, so many individuals are, and, and you see that they were born somewhere in the U.S., then it's a requirement and that's something that is asked. But I, I've, I haven't seen it. It's very rare, at least for bank institutions. I haven't seen it. And I've David, opened David, up with numerous banks. I'm a full-fledged Bahamian born in the Bahamas. As a matter of fact, I'm a former Commonwealth Bank employee. So trust me, they know I'm Bahamian. Ms. Sands. Oh. So However, I'm just saying my experience, I mean, my experience and these are recent accounts and stuff like that I've seen where it wasn't asked, but I have seen in circumstances where colleagues of mine who are Bahamian American and they've opened up accounts that then it's asked, um, but not for full 100% Bahamian like me, it, it hasn't been asked. And this is, you know, fairly recent for different banks. So maybe Commonwealth are doing it. Maybe I don't know. They just slip up. I don't know. But it's not being done as a requirement um, from my experience, from what I'm seeing. Hi, Ms. Sands. Hi, Ms. Hepburn. How are you doing? Yeah, if I can add. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> if I can add, um, what is happening, um, and from my experience of working at CIBC, what is happening is that um, the Customer service offices are doing a drive-by explanation of what the customer is signing. So you may be signing a form that you really don't know what you're signing because um, as my experience as a compliance officer, some of the customer service officers who open the accounts don't really have a lot of information or knowledge on CRS and FATCA themselves. 
So what they do, they do a drive-by where they just tell the customer, oh, you need to sign this form because this is, this is a U.S. requirement. And I think that's what's happening. And maybe if you've had to open an account recently and you say you don't remember signing the form, it's because um, the customer service officer didn't explain to you what the form is. She just told you to sign it. Because, you know, when you're opening those accounts, you sign like about 10 forms but they don't go through every form and explain to you what it is. So maybe that's the, that's the case that's happening. Yeah, maybe it was in a clause somewhere in the, um, in the opening documents um, and not a specific document that has FATCA. Um, and maybe it could have been that case as well. Just or they may have incorporated, they may have incorporated in one of their um, um, existing forms <laughs> But then you have to flat sign something to open a bank account um, that is your disclosure regarding U.S. bank accounts or U.S. assets. You have to sign something. It's in there. But the, um, see, the customer service offices are not going into deep explanation. So you really don't know what it is that you're signing. That's what's happening. Because I, I, from, from what I know, it's mandatory. Yeah, it is. You, you have to sign it. It, it is mandatory. That sounds more like it because I just opened a bank account in September and nobody said anything about FATCA, but they did say sign this, sign this, sign this. And I guess after a whole day of being in the bank trying to open one bank account, I just signed in two. I ain't really reading, which yeah. is not the right thing to do, but they just say sign, 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 yeah, sign there. Exactly. And there's so much stuff that you got to read through. Like who has that kind of time? <laughs> you on your lunch hour? So you ain't going to read through all the stuff. Yeah, that's true. Me, I don't sign nothing but I don't read because y'all ain't y'all ain't y'all ain't catch me on no clause that I don't know about. You only just stop that. I don't care how long it takes you, just how long it takes you to sit in the bank, read what you are signing people. Note to self, okay? You have your own company, y'all right? You're all going dead quiet. You have your own company, right? Um, I also I am I am also an employee of another company. Okay, because I can't be in a bank for six hours reading through. But guess what? I can guarantee you if something goes wrong with your account and you don't remember what you signed and they holding you to that. I you agree. I you agree. spend that time reading it. I agree. I agree. And also with, um, with regards to signing without reading, you have to be careful with that because what happens is when you have a dispute Mm -hmm. um on your account mm -hmm. you know the first thing the bank offices go to hey you sign this disclosure and you sign that and you sign that you got to be careful with that too um because that can come back to haunt you so i would advise anybody um, who's opening a new bank account to um read the disclosures um even in getting a loan because as a loan officer one of the disclosures that we had that the customer had to sign is that um you give us permission to do a credit check or a background check to see if you have any existing loans or bad credit or anything. And a lot of people didn't know what they were signing and we, and we called and, and we got information from the, um, from the other commercial banks and lo and behold, somebody, somebody is applying for a mortgage for 250,000 that has a bad mortgage somewhere else that it hasn't been paying for six months. So you gotta be careful with that um, signing and not reading what you're signing. I think um, one of the issues that I had run into was um, a, client, a client came to me with an issue with uh, Scotiabank. And apparently Scotiabank has this thing where once you open up an account or that is a saving, it's a savings account or checking account and you have a credit card facility or you have a mortgage facility with that bank. What they do is if you go in the bank and you place, as long as you have money on your account, based on what you signed with them, they have pretty much the right to move your money around. So you go and you put money on the account for your credit card, but they go and they apply it to your mortgage and you have to fight them to reverse it. And they hardly ever do because that's what you signed. That's what you agreed to. Thank you all so much for enforcing my point. I appreciate that. I have a I have a question. Um, I'm not sure who was just speaking um, before Godet, but 
is it a is it a requirement now for for customers to give the lender or the financial institution um, the authority to communicate with other financial institutions about you know their personal accounts? Is that what I gathered? Yeah, um, you sign a waiver. You, yeah. When you sign a waiver, if you're getting a credit, you sign a waiver because they these banks figure out behaviors and don't always be 100% honest. So you can't come back and say, well, oh, how are you going to the bank? And I tell you, I had no loan because you signed the document in their loan package. There is a document that specifically gives them the right to go and check because you have to sign it because we have confidentiality laws in banking in the Bahamas. The banks right. can't do it without your permission. Right. But you signed the document, so you gave them your permission. So that is something new. I'm, that's something yep. new because I've not heard that before. Not new. Oh, that, that ain't new. Okay. That been in that, that them same forms, you all signing and ain't reading. And ain't reading, exactly. And that's been going on for years and all of the banks cooperate with that. All of, all of the commercial banks, they cooperate. And um, I think it's, it's in line of, uh, um, with what's going to happen when the, the credit bureau thing comes in place. And so because the banks are preparing for that, they've been going ahead and just, you know, they've been cooperating with each other. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm not quite familiar with that system. It's happening and it's been happening. And I mean, and even with the regular savings account, I don't know if y'all are aware, but in their terms and condition, the bank can withhold giving you withdrawals for at least seven days of your own money. Plenty of people don't know that. They go in the bank and they carry on bond because they want their money. No, 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 no. If you read your terms and condition, the bank is well within their rights to say, you have to come back in two days or three days. And I found that out when I worked in Commonwealth Bank because we had a customer who came in there for a large withdrawal and they wanted to do some checks before they gave it to him and they told them they're not prepared to give it to him. Now they carry on so bad in the bank. They pull out the terms of, uh, uh, and conditions for him. Listen to me. So he almost closed the whole bank down. But like most people, he signed that document and they never read it. Now, I don't know if they've changed the amount of time going, I mean, at this point, but I can tell you that I was in black and white in the terms and conditions when you open up a savings account. Okay, I just wondered how that worked, especially with civil servants who, who seem to have, you know, endless borrowing powers, right? No, no. Not necessarily. Endless borrowing power, you mean? The banks are but a limited up power. Only certain banks. The credit unions will not. Oh, <laughs> they, wow. they will. <laughs> the credit union will leave a hundred dollars on their paycheck every month. They, they don't pay attention to us. What? Yeah. Oh. But only I think the Canadian banks try to be strict with that. That's not that's not legal to, to let them go home with a hundred a hundred dollars. Only a certain percentage of their income they're allowed to, to use. Right. Yeah. Only like 40 40 percent. Like for, right? 40 and like for government 45. workers, for us we can go up to like 45. We can push it to 45. Okay. That's not true. Okay. That's, that's not yeah. true, people. Boy, that's Brown. Not true. Brown, that is I'm a policy. People go home that is like a bank's policy. Dollars. You're seeing people go home at like how much? What? Hundred dollars. One hundred dollars. I've seen it. Mr. Brown. <laughs> that is I a bank's I policy. In. It is not illegal. The bank said that themselves. That is the no end law. So that it's it's completely legal to send completely someone home. Legal. Yes. Fifty-eight dollars. Yes. It's not ethical. But it's legal. We ain't talking about ethics. It's completely <laughs> legal. Lemon, lemon tomatoes, please. You're gonna. How is it legal? Tomatoes. I thought that there was a, a stat a, I, I, regulation I, I, on that. There I thought it was. There, there isn't. I just sat on a on a um 
Velvet on the day, where the executive director of the Securities Commission debased that myth. It's not a law. It is a practice that the banks do because they figure they want you to be able to live. But so I could max out my salary if I wanted to. But that is why money lenders can lend up to as much as they want and they could charge you whatever interest. Because only the banks put that together as a policy, I think like the current bank association or something. Daddy in law. Y'all learned something today? That 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 blew my mind just now. I still gotta look up. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. So that thank you for that information. I didn't know that. So that means when they tell people that when certain banks tell people they don't qualify because they are at their max, that's not necessarily true. They are at their max in terms of the risk that that bank would want to take on. So it is true for them. Right. <laughs> you remember now when we when we when we talked initially about risk rating, the bank decides what risk they are willing to take. They decide their own risk appetite. And if I determine I only want people with up to 45% debt service ratio. I can put that in, in place. The central bank don't tell you what you could do. They do not do that to banks. They, they can tell you the interest as high as you can go, but they do not tell you uh, 45%. They don't do that. It's a practice. It's a policy. And they do that out of good governance. I actually, I actually thought that was mandated from the central bank to maintain this 45% debt service ratio. That's a central bank's policy as well. It's not law. Right. No, it's not law. I agree that it is really not law, but you know, we are governed by, you know, a lot of the policies by central bank and usually they say 45%. And, and how much people you know up to 60? Well, they're allowed to be up to 60 if we're putting them in a better financial position. So like the um, government persons they spoke about earlier, if their debt service was 80 and we're bringing them down to 60, then by all means, but we won't just take you from zero to 60. But you are correct. We have a lot of persons now with a very, very high debt service ratio. You wonder how they survive. Right. So you can imagine those persons now getting income tax, right? No, we can't imagine. <laughs> I hear coupled, somebody said the other day. I agree, can't imagine. <laughs> Not coupled with VAT. Like I heard someone said the other day, Uncle Sam don't trust you to give them back their money. That's why they take it out at first. Right? Agreed, it makes sense. Take it out first. But you taking it out first, ain't nothing to go to the bank because the rest didn't max out. Well, that is true. <laughs> that is true. So if you were to impose an income tax on on the Bahamas, a lot of people won't be able to live because how would they service their loans, their existing loans now? If I'm already going home at $58 in my pocket and my loan is 700 and now you're taking on an additional hundred and something dollars, just say for income docs. So how are we supposed to pay Commonwealth Bank? You think the government of any country- The government first, eh? Hey? Yeah, so the government first, so the bank will have to restructure your, 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 your loan. That you won't be but irresponsible with your money. But they would take out the government, the government's money would come out first, and so the bank would have to restructure, right? Exactly, because guess what? If the government paying you, you think they can send you the money for the send back? No. <laughs> it's going to be deducted prior to the treasury releasing the rest of the money to the bank. That'll be a lot of restructuring. Your loans ain't got nothing to do with the government. Let's be honest. Yes. And this is why I'm saying to you guys, we need to have the conversation as a community, as a country. Because we are consumers. A lot of, a lot of things that payments buy really ain't not a necessity. It's to keep up with the Browns. Sorry, I'm using your last name, Mr. Brown. 
is to keep up with the Browns <laughs> and the Joneses. Yes? I buy a new car, so my neighbor got to buy a new car. I furnish my house, so my neighbor got to furnish it. No. Me and you don't necessarily have to be in the same tax bracket or earning bracket. Do you understand? So when you look at the loans in, 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 in the loan portfolio in the Bahamas, it ain't mortgages with killing people. It's consumer loans. So from a tax perspective, we need to have the conversation in our country. This is why the, 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 the bread basket item debate is such a hot debate because people figure, oh my God, you people scrap it now, but they put themselves in that position. And yes, I agree. Uh, you know, minimum wage and all those things need to go up. I, I totally get it. However, we do not teach fiscal responsibility enough in this country. I can go to the bank and get a loan to go on vacation. I have a lot of, I have a lot of five thousand dollars. In, in one week and they give me a year and a half to pay it off that makes sense i have i mean i agree that we are not taught fiscal responsibility here right because that's something that i always preach it's something that i felt i had to learn on my own however i feel like we are moving away from um consumer loans like killing us out in essence i don't know if it's like a generational thing but I don't, I don't um, see or think that many or as much persons are being consumed by these personal loans as bad as it was in the past. I don't know if other persons feel the same way. I don't work in the banking industry now. This is just like an observation generally or from stories that I've heard from other persons. And when I say like consumer loans, like I don't think as much persons uh, like in the younger generations, so to speak, quote unquote, are going to the banks for loans for like cars and like um, vacations and I don't know, things along that line. I think it's more, it's less. I don't know. That's just my opinion though. I have no proof, no facts, no evidence or anything. That's just my personal opinion. So please do not attack me. No, it's not less. A lot of them are just not getting approved. I just want to the banks and lend them the money. <laughs> A lot of banks, a lot of banks are lending them the money. I, I've seen instances where someone worked at a pizza place and they had like a loan with a certain financial institution for like 40,000. And we were all looking at it like, how you want us to consolidate just this? Are you bringing this over with a mortgage? They just wanted to consolidate it, but we don't do that. So we still was baffled that how is it that you work at this place making this salary, you were able to get a top up whereas your loan is 40,000. So a lot of people, a lot of younger people are, are getting funds from the bank and a lot of young people are getting credit cards. And now we find it that they don't know how to use the credit cards, but they get the credit cards, they go away, they max the credit cards out. Then years later, when they are settled and mature, they come back to the bank to say, hey, I wanna get a mortgage. We look in the system, you get a charge off credit card. We, you can have all the down payment you want. We still don't wanna do business with you of something you did back when you was 23. You're like 32 now and you want a mortgage, but you can't get it because you write off the credit card. We don't forgive. We say we forgive like seven years, but when you send that application back, 90% chance you're getting a decline. Wow. And a, lot of, a lot of young people don't understand that they, they get these things now and they splurge in their younger years, but when they finish college and they get mature, it still comes back to bite you. That's for that's for us. I don't know about other bikes. Sorry, I forgot to pause. Sorry. What did you say, Donna? No, sorry. I I accidentally took it off mute. My 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 apologies. <laughs> I don't think we do a good job of it. You're breaking up, Patrick. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I feel that we don't do a, a good job of educating our customers, particularly when it comes to the credit cards. Um, you find, like Brown said, you find a lot, a lot of young persons getting three and four thousand dollar credit cards um, within a year. It's already maxed out. Or what we do is we tack it on if they get a consumer loan, we tack on an additional $1,500, $2,000 credit card without educating the customer on really how the credit card works. 
credit card as the highest interest accumulating uh, product that a bank has. And the customers aren't aware. They feel if they put this $50 a month onto that credit card, that's sufficient. But really and truly a credit card, when you use it, say you spend $300 on the card, it's expected that you pay that $300 off within a reasonable time frame, say one, two or three months. But we let we get them on this minimum payment of $30 a month, which really and truly is only covering the interest. And it's it, it's kind of like a black hole. And I, I feel we need to do better at educating our customers, those of us who are in the banking arena. You see a lot of a lot of officers, they they have these heavy goals on them. So because they have these targets to make, they then turn the product pushing. This might yeah. this may not this this product I'm offering you might not be the best product for your solution right now. Mm-hmm. Oh, you can't get a pool for the five thousand loan to go Miami. Let me just give them a five thousand dollar credit card because she could get a credit card. Now we're product pushing just because. However, I got to meet my targets. I need to do four credit cards a week. So now it, it's it's like me or the custom me or the customer. A lot of loan officers find themselves in a position where it's, it's me or the customer. Because if I don't sell this to this woman, I know they're gonna ask me why you ain't do this this week, why you ain't do that that week. So it's just the pressure now on a lot of loan officers, which lead them to like pushing products on customers. So let me give you all a hint: any credit card, no matter what you pay, what you sorry, what you charge on it. If you pay it off before the statement cycle, you pay zero interest. Zero interest. Zero. So for those of you who are not spendthrifts, that's one way to, to reduce that. If you know you can only afford to pay $300 a month, then that's all you charge. That will be the one thing you, you're not paying any interest on. And especially if it's a card where you earn points or earn um, travel miles or something like that. That's a way to keep, keep your debt down, but still have a credit card in your possession because everywhere you go, you're gonna need it, right? Right. So we can move to CRS. I think we talked a little bit about it. And CRS is where we have the automatic multilateral tax information sharing IGAs. So, I don't know, know if you recall, at first we, Bahamas signed where we were going to do country to country, and then that caused an issue, so we just signed up to automatic. Anybody remember that? that? Anybody here remembers that time a few years ago? No, no. No, my sons, what's that? You could say that again? So I was saying when we initially signed up for CRS, okay. the Bahamas decided we were going to do country by country. Like we would want, we would sign up to whoever we want to sign up to. However, we got some pushback and some pressure. And so we just signed up to the full automatic multilateral um, IGA. Google it. Hold on. Well, Alicia, Alicia, Google it for us. Sorry, what am I cooking? <laughs> You, you Googling Bahamas um, CR, CRS IGA. So um, IGA is inter, intergovernmental agreements, right? Agreement signed between governments. It's called, and then you, I don't know if you're familiar with AEOI, Automatic Exchange of Information, that goes hand in hand with the CRS reporting. So, you have to ensure that as a country, you're signed up to those multilateral agreements to ensure that one, uh, you, uh, you, you are not assisting any citizen of another country to um, evade their tax requirements. You find it yet, Alicia? Okay, so it's 7.37. Let's take a 10. Child, she didn't put that in the group. She don't play. Thank you. 
let's take a 10, five, 10 minute break um, at this point, and then we're going to come back. I need to get some water. I've been talking for almost an hour and a half now. Okay, it's 737, that's resume at 745. Okay. Hello, y'all can okay. hear me? Thank you. Okay. okay. All right.
Hi, everyone. Hello. Everybody back? Hi. Hi. Hi, we're back. Okay, so we are on, I'm looking at the moment on page 179 as it relates to criminal liability for laundering the proceeds of domestic tax evasion. So this is actually based on the UK. So I don't know exactly um, if we have a comparable act in the Bahamas. Can any of the attorneys tell me? Or, or does it fall under the Proceeds of Crime Act? Yeah, I think it falls under poker somewhat. Not that I have poker with me, but I think this belongs in poker. I'm thinking the same thing, but I just wanted to refer to my learned colleagues. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I thought we were using my learned colleagues, <laughs> Mrs. Ash. <Satch. laughs> <laughs> I know you're going to be behind, David. In, in the first class, I remember that. So. <laughs> David, I had to pull out tonight, man, because I mean, and my learned colleagues aren't helping me. I actually thought in something illegal. Oh, wow. I got a couple learned colleagues on tonight. Wow, wow, wow. I can need to call on y'all at some point. I only get two more weeks with y'all, you know. So I'm I'm thinking that it'll fall under the process of crime act. I mean, I don't I don't see it falling any place else because I don't think we have a specific tax um law. So it also speaks to tax, um, sorry, criminal, criminal liability for London, the process of foreign tax evasion, which um, in the UK obviously has a slight difference, yes? Um, Ms. Sands, do you think that eventually we're going to have to legislate something regarding tax? I would say within the next year. We only in February, right? And I can guarantee you the global minimum tax push is here to stay. And if you have to implement a global minimum corporate tax, you're going to have to implement an entire new tax regime. You agree? Yeah, well, something that I actually found out today, right? So what happens is when you purchase, when you purchase a property, and you send that document in, and that document does not come with a mortgage. Usually, sometimes you have to send that document in with an appraisal. So, as apparently as of January, it's literally been a crap storm because what's now happening is that we're, uh, inland revenue goes out on a day assess the property themselves. So, let's say you and the vendor or the buyer and the seller agree that. The, the property is valued or the appraisal value of the property is 150. They're going to sell it to you for 140. Fine. So your conveyance says $140,000. What's happening now is inland revenue goes and assesses the property themselves. So if inland revenue says that based on their assessment, this property is valued at 200,000, you have to pay what inland revenue says the property is assessed for and you have to pay the real property tax for that assessment. Um, I can attest to that because I just got my real property tax bill and my property assessed amount is significantly higher than it was last year. So yeah, they are going around and doing their own assessments and I guess revaluing your property and then they charge you based on that new value. But what is the bank? 
looking at is the bank going to use inland revenues evaluation because you would have gotten a mortgage based on the you know what you and the seller agreed right and what you could have um gotten approved for um the bank even questioned the bank told me to query the real property tax amount because they are they have the value based on i think the appraisal per their records or whatever they have and when i sent in the real property tax receipt they um even said that it's a significant job so they told me to query it that cost strictly on the customer that wouldn't be the bank don't get involved in it at least for us we don't get involved in it for a purchase No, but she's talking about an existing building. This is where she's living. She's been living there for a number of years. So if they decide to re-evaluate and reassess your house, like there's going to be like, for sure to say, it's going to be a crop storm. And, the and way are they doing it just because they want to raise real property tax? Like you have to think about all these things. Well, what's that? What's that? What's, what's what is going to cause cause as well? The cause the after effect of that is going to be okay well what can i really sell my property for because my appraiser telling me that my property is valued 150 mm -hmm. but i have to let this i have to let the buyer know that based on the assessment um let's say best based on the assessment what your property tax is given your property tax in the property is um 200 so now am i obligated to say to the seller, sorry, to the buy, to, to the buyer that well, I know I sell it to you for one forty, and my appraiser say it's one fifty. But when you go to pay real property tax, you can be paying on two hundred. I think you can fight that with them though. Once you got an appraiser, once you have that appraiser done by a certified appraiser, you can fight that with them. They'll have to provide you evidence showing you as to why your property is valued at, two, at over the amount a certified appraiser brought it into especially if you're dealing with the bank as well, they'll have to provide some reasoning as to why. Because appraisals only is do their appraisal based on, your home is be appraised based on surrounding houses and, and inside of the area. They take, a, they, take a, they take the value of each of those houses to get your house total value. So you can fight that with them. You, you don't have to just sit on that if they say that. We even had customers who, property was valued with them at a certain amount and they're not even supposed to pay real property tax because it's under the 250 so they fought it and we were able to follow through it'll take a while though the new law is 300 now right correct was that amended i i don't think it was amended as yet to say 300 oh. we, we still are 250 so we still going with the 250 And a lot of the assessments with real property tax are, is wrong right now. A lot of them have homes in residential areas. We've seen homes in residential areas assessed as commercial properties, but they are in residential areas. So now you can't follow through. They have to go back. They, uh, it's, it's ridiculous down now. So Rochetta, um. You're an attorney. What 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 say ye? I say ye in trouble. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm 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 ju we're just kind of getting the gist of everything and what's going on. And so now, you know, the attorneys are we're conversing with each other and trying to figure out what do we do, you know, because now now you have transactions that are just going in for financing. And so we have to say to the bank, well. The bank is requiring that that person gives them that back stamping beforehand and the bank is requiring that any real property tax is either clear it off or undertake to clear it off but you know now that the properties are being reassessed the, the amount is going up and so the question really is who's going to cover this cost and and like i said at the moment we're just talking amongst ourselves because literally we're all having the same issue we're just trying to figure out what are we going to do about it and we, we really don't know well at least i know where to come um 
if I have an issue like that, because by, by that time you'll be you you you'll already know um what Dan says, eh? The, nice. the fix the fix that we've been saying is when you draft your agreement for sale between vendor and purchaser, that you state that the well you have the purchase price, right? But then there's a clause in there to say that when you go to real property tax to declare the purchaser as the new owner and real property tax assesses the property to be higher than that listed on the conveyance, then there's a clause in there that says that the vendor and the purchaser will pay the difference. They will share in the difference of the higher assessment done by the real property tax department. So that's what's been happening. Yeah, but as, as time goes on, Joe, as time goes on, every year, that means that you purchase a property for 150, but you're paying for the assessment of a 200. So that's still not fair. But how do we change that though? If that is real property tax regulation under the stamp, under the stamp act, how do we change that? Because if you, if we read the stamp act, they have, their assessors have a right to hike up the price despite what the, the brokers and the realtors may have assessed the property value to be. They also have right. a right to tell you how and why is the property valuing at that. Because you can't take that, you can't take your real property tax assessment value to the bank and use it as equity. So if you can't use it as equity to say refinance or do other things with your home, they have a right, they have to let you know how is it that my house came in at this X amount of dollars. Right. They have to provide reasons and grounds. Re yeah, they and, 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 mm -hmm, and for the assessment. If you are a person who are aware of this, you can go to them like provide me reason as to why and mm -hmm. call your call your appraiser. Mm -hmm. And the appraiser, for those who look at an appraisal, the appraisal is outline like every single thing about the neighboring, the area as to why he, he derived at this point. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Real property tax, that's where they usually is put their foot in their mouth when we advise customers and tell customers how to go about it. When customers go back to them with their appraisals and, and started to like complain, mm -hmm. they can't provide reasoning as to why. Justifications. So, mm -hmm. so because of that, a lot of customers get their stuff thrown out and they go. It's just a matter of putting the pressure. Now the back and forth behind it, listen, <laughs> it's a lot. Hmm. So it's frustrating. The frustration part of it yeah, is you be but, like, forget it. Okay. Wow. So see, uh, we only talk about one one section of a tax regime. Imagine when you have lots of other things come in onto that plate. That's only real property tax. Yeah. Now <laughs> customs, when you're you're declared baggage is you now going, you 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 doing that online, eh? Before you reach, isn't that what they're now doing? Mm -hmm. yep. How does that work for people who ain't got no phone? I'm just asking, because that's the tax. Are you going to tell me you think I should have a phone? <laughs> no, I'm, 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 we're talking about the whole tax regime, right? So how does that work? You can't disenfranchise in any part of the population. And not everybody has a phone. Yes, we think everybody has a phone, but not everybody has a phone. My learned well, colleague, anybody have any answer? Some manual, some manual declaration. And secondly, what if you do have a phone and your phone crash the minute you come off the plane? I love the bomb. But that's what I'm saying. If, if you're telling me you're going totally in the app or whatever online uh, portal you now have, you have to always have some... Um, exception. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exception to a caveat or something because, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Case by case basis, yeah. Exactly. Okay, so uh, the, the, the fourth section of this unit speaks um, specifically to the UK and all of their, I would say the um, 
their overseas territories and all of the countries that they still control. It also speaks to uh, the Swiss. These are things that you should know, but I'm not certain that based on the, the assignment that you're going to need them for that specific assignment. But please go ahead and ensure that you read it and you recognize and understand what is going on in the criminal liability aspect of tax evasion, yes? Um, in conclusion of this unit, it just talks specifically about um, when tax avoidance becomes too aggressive and it goes over the line into tax evasion. So now there is now a considerable risk that the client and their service provider may be prosecuted. The client is guilty of tax evasion and moreover, the service provider may be guilty of money laundering. So obviously there's a thin line between the two. Some people will try and stretch it as far as they can. But as a provider, a service provider, whether it be a, an attorney, an accountant, a banker, you have to recognize that you have to work within the guidelines and the framework for that specific country and the country in which your client um, is a national or a citizen. Yes, because a lot of times we think, oh, we live in the Bahamas, but our clients live on outside of the Bahamas. So we do have to be cognizant of what they are responsible for doing as well as what we're responsible for doing. Yeah? Yes. Any, any questions before I move on? Ms. Sands, I just have a um, question in regards to the, um, I know like the primary legislation, um, we would be, it would be more like the um, Proceeds of Crime Act, but in terms of like secondary legislation that is spoken about in um, chapter three, would it more be, in terms of secondary, would it be I don't know, just like more like guidelines. Let me let me let me let somebody who was at class last week answer you. Let's go, people. I know you all should know this because we talked about this last week. Mm -hmm. Hold on, hold on. Don't answer that question yet because that's a part of the paper. Does anybody have any questions on unit four before we could conclude? Tanisha, we coming back to that. Okay. Everybody good? With laundering yes, the proceeds of tax evasion, mm -hmm. not avoidance, evasion? Evasion. Yeah. Okay. Cool. One second for me. Give me two seconds, folks. Miguel.
I'm just trying to reach, I think it's Miguel that started the class for us. So just give me a, a few seconds, please. Yes, ma'am. While I wait on Miguel, can somebody please answer Denisha? I'm sorry, can, um, it's been a few minutes. Can Denisha, can you repeat your question? Um, I was asking, I understand, um, just for clarity, um, primary legislation would be more like, um, Proceeds of Crime Act, or let's say um, the FTRA as an act. But I was asking in terms of what would be considered more like regulations under, within our jurisdiction geared towards, um, yeah, um, what would be a secondary, a secondary um, legislation, considered secondary legislation. Well, from my understanding, it's only one legislation. That's the act. That's law. And the law right. starts at the top. That's the government. Um, and that's the primary. And after the primary, because the government enacts the law. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we have regulation, which is what we do at the commission. Mm -hmm. we, we govern based on the law, but there's a regulation that sort of like simplifies what the law says now there's sometimes that the law and the regulation is unclear and they may have some gray areas and what happens is from and based on what what would what, what we do we, we see these gray areas so if the law doesn't say what's supposed to happen and the regulation doesn't give it a, a clear picture mm -hmm. we, the, the the regulators create guidelines, rules and guidelines based on what's happening. So um, I think it's, it's, it's three layers and maybe Masan's can correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, but the law is the primary, which is the legislation. Right. The secondary is the regulation. And then when we're going through the process and we find gray areas, we create rules and guidelines. That's my understanding of it. Um, so, I so give us an example of a secondary legislation. I can go best based on the SIA. I can go based on the security mm -hmm. industry because that's where I work. Securities industry act. Because I'm more familiar with that, I can go based on that. We have the securities industry act, and then we have the securities industry regulation, and then we have rules and guidelines. Now, we've recently had mm -hmm. um, new legislation for the financial corporate service providers. And we've also had new legislation for, um, I think investment funds. And I think securities industry is on the way as well, or it has already been tabled. I'm but see Donna, um, Donna, what I'm trying to understand is whether the securities industry act would just fall under pretty much primary legislation. That's primary. Right, right. And yeah. then whether maybe recommendations from let's say FATF or CFATF would be considered more secondary legislation. 
Just no, trying to I clarify. Would, no, I, 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 would, I would think the regulations that accompany the act, I would consider them to be secondary. Okay. Yeah. Regulations that accompany the act. Okay. Secondary. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. But I think, you know, in essence, how we create our legislation and laws, we do it based, and, and Ms. Sands can correct me if I'm wrong, but we're all governed by FADF. So right. we do it based mm -hmm. on what FADF recommends. So based on FADF recommendation, we enact these laws based right. on what we recommend. See mm -hmm. FADF. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ms. Right. Sands can correct me if I'm wrong. Remember, Donna, that FADF is not a country. They cannot create law. So when you talk about primary legislation, FADF are only recommendations, yes? Right. So the laws right. themselves that are enacted by the country, that's the primary. And then, like I said last week, the regulations that go with them. So the regulations pretty much break down the law and tell you what is expected, how you are expected to do this. And then when you go beneath that, the regulators then would come up with their own policy and guidance and guidelines and things of that nature. You see what I'm saying? So it's building right. on the same thing that Donna said, mm -hmm. but remember, right. you, if you think about the FTRA, that's the act. But when right. you talk about how things are supposed to be done in a banking institution, the regulations specify those things. They lay them out. Okay. Yeah. So yes, there's the FTRA and then there's the FTRR. Right, right. Right. If sometimes, you at, sorry, if you if you look at a lot of the acts, they have accompanying regulations, and not all of them do, but some of them do. What okay. do you want to say, um, um Donna? Because sometimes the, the acts are very vague. And, and because they like I said last week, they're legally they're written by attorneys, but the regs are usually based on what uh, I would say industry participants, because you know they, they put them out for consultation. Industry participants would come back and say, okay, we understand what you're trying to achieve by enacting this act or this law, but here is how this works in day to day. Okay. And that's what the regulations determine. They will tell you like what the penalties are. They will tell you like the expectation. The act itself lays out the minimum of I okay. guess criminal, non-criminal, mm -hmm. and then the regs tell okay. you, okay, as a as a bank, as an SCB licensee, this is what the regulator is going to expect from you. And from that, okay. we the regulators take their guidance mm -hmm. to write their, their um rules and policies and all of those things. Okay. And Ms. Sands, that's how we get the central bank guidelines. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you, ladies. I'm understanding now. Thank you for clarity. Okay, hold on one second for me, y'all. <laughs> 